Okay, welcome to Theorycraft, a live podcast where game developers and their players come together in conversation. Candace cannot be with us this week, so we beam this live to her gridlocked vehicle on the freeways of Los Angeles. And we are honored to have not one, but two special guests with us this week. We have the inimitable Kevin Jordan returning to the podcast. It's great to see you, man. Welcome back. You too. Nice to be back. And as well, we have our main event, a developer and author, John Statz. So welcome to Theorycraft, John. It's a huge pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, man. Yeah, Luca and I talked about this moment for a long time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the anticipation has been real for sure. Uh, and we've had to kick the can a few times, but I know that... Uh, Chris and I and many of the people in the Discord are huge fans of the WoW Diary. You know, you obviously had the opportunity to work directly alongside Chris and Kevin for a good number of years. You oh, yeah. name check Kevin quite a few times in the book, which was really a joy to uncover as I was kind of skimming back through it. Why don't you tell us a, a little bit about yourself for those who aren't familiar with the John Stats story? So I was the first level designer on World of Warcraft. I moved into video games from advertising. I, live, I was in New York City for 10 years before I moved to California. So I jumped straight up to the top of uh, game development. Pretty got, I got pretty lucky. Yeah, I was in truth, I was the only 3D level designer that wanted to uh, work in Blizzard, which is something that is so strange to hear now. Uh, right. because it's like it wasn't a place at the time for 3D uh, uh, game development. It was all Texas. It was all shooters. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And I was on WoW for 10 years. I'm, I've aged out of computer development, and now I'm an author. I write uh, books. Oh, cool. I, I saw in the book, too, were you doing some like tabletop game development? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Oddly enough, and I moved to my home state in Ohio, which is where nice. I am now. And Ohio, Ohio is like, it's just this hotbed of uh, board game development. I had no idea it was <laughs> when I came out here. And so, yeah, I go to play tests like every week with various game groups of uh, uh, board game developers. And, uh, and that's how John and I met. As a matter of fact, oh yeah, yeah, playing actually, board games at game Blizzard, night, yeah. Blizzard game night, we would uh, QA and developers would get together and play board games. Mm -hmm. Was that in that like library thing, or that probably came years and years later when they moved to the oh, current yeah, this was campus? Oh, yeah. thing. Okay, there's we no, no library <laughs> when the book was being written. Yeah, Kevin, were we playing in the only conference, like dedicated conference room? In, yeah, like the Blizzard? downstairs. By yeah, the, you know, the, the, yeah, lobby, the, right. H, the HQ conference room <laughs> had what? Did we have four chairs or six chairs? Right, right. It was tiny. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, we didn't wasn't organized at all. It was tiny. Very few visitors expected, you know, just a bunch of nerds doing their thing every day. Pretty much. Yeah. It was not a, uh, it, I was, I wrote in my book about how unimpressed I was. I mean, coming from yes. New York city where they just are just lavish, stupid money. They throw at boardrooms and stuff like that. Then coming to California and it's like, you know, in, in a corporate park, this, this nondescript building, there's no signs anywhere. And yeah, this mm -hmm. is where Blizzard is. Right. We have yeah. both bathrooms and a drinking fountain. Look at us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you spend a lot of time, as you mentioned, describing what it was like to first land at Blizzard and, you know, locate the role, interview for it in the beginning chapters of the WoW Diary. And like, obviously, I want to spend a good amount of time talking about this book, which... I don't know if it's still available for sale. I got it off your Kickstarter, but God, what a fantastic piece of game dev literature. I, I, I just feel like, yeah, you know, your your personality and your, um, your love and your wide-eyed kind of excitement for everything completely comes through in this. This is like basically a beginning to end um, or like a good, a, a sizable time frame um, development window into vanilla World of Warcraft. And it's just like full of stories and names. And it makes me feel the things that I feel are the, the best experiences of game development. Like all the excitement is in there. And I was just like, God, I, I relate to this so much. And it, it's cool to be a fly on the wall. So like the first Thank thing you. I want to ask yeah. you, it, yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, and also great job on like the binding and the presentation and everything too. Like <laughs> it's, it's so freaking nicely put together. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, what a luxury package. So you address in the book, you know, how you did get permission to write this. I think you said you talked to Shane DeBeery or somebody. They asked you when you sure. were going to finally Jalen do it. Jalen Brack and Shane, yeah. Okay. But like, there are dev diaries and blog entries out there. I feel like um, I had never really encountered anything this in depth before, especially coming from a company that's like, for a while, was almost like famously closed curtain is blizzard. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. insane that you got all of this out there. Can you give like just a little more context on how you got the clearance to just write a full expose of, of the development of World of Warcraft of all things? Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I, I, I the, the one thing I can touch on, the reason why this isn't done a lot is because unless you're taking notes, and I, I was very devoted every month I took notes. I was very that was my one weekend I would just dedicate myself to going through the emails to find out what happened. If, if you don't take crazy amounts of notes, you forget right. it. You forget <laughs> it all. I mean, you would never, like, there are things that if people wanted. Uh, I, I ended the book at the launch of the game because that's where I stopped taking uh, notes. And I realized if I wanted to make a, a WoW Diary 2, I couldn't do it because I just the the, the right. timeline and chronology. It's just it's an enormous amount of work. And yeah, I verify that statement, but I honestly can't remember if it's if it's, if I remember yeah. anything or not. <laughs> but I interviewed all the uh, developers as things go, just because I was personally interested in seeing how games are. You know, it's the first job I ever had that there were animators in the building. I mean, that's like. That's like movie magic to me. So, uh, yeah, I was just super, super enthusiastic, and I uh, pumped everybody uh, uh, for information for all I could. But um, I knew that Blizzard is, oh, my gosh, you know, their legal department is like, it, it's funny. What, when I was waiting for permission, what they'd have to do, they had to read the book and make sure there's nothing inside it that could damage the company. And that is... When they told me that they were the, the person reviewing my book was reviewing the Croatian uh, language for one of like Northrend art book or something, like, oh wow, they have to act, the legal department has to review every single language, every publication worldwide. That's how busy their legal department is. Uh, so I, I, I kind of realized like what a back burner project I was. So it took like a couple years for for, for get, uh, Blizzard to get actually sign off on everything. Wow. <laughs> that was, but and, and I had to have the book completely written, written from beginning to end. Like it had to be like locked down content wise. I couldn't like add to any things. In fact, we were talking about the tornado that hit Blizzard. Those were the two photos I added during the process of a legal review that I had to get permission for those uh, images uh, to, to, to be added. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's honestly, it was, uh, they, they knew where my heart is, you know, they right. knew how much I like blizzard and it was like, kind of like a handshake deal where, you know, they gave me permission. It cost me nothing. Uh, and you know, Jay Allen Brack and Shane were, they were rooting for me. And I think Shane, because I knew him, he was my roommate for a few years back when I knew he was kind of like, and he was, I think he was at the time, uh, what was his title? Something ridiculous, like, uh, I don't know, head sheriff or something, something ridiculous. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I can't even remember, but I knew he would be an advocate for the book because you need someone really high up there <laughs> to like push it because there's lots of things that when you have a company that big from department to department, lots of things die. So, uh, yeah, a big shout out to Shane and all his effort. <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, it really speaks to y your character and your status uh, within this group that they mm -hmm. they let you do it. They must have known that you had, you know, just the best intentions. And like, I will get around to talking about the content of the book a little more in a second. But like, as I was, you know, rereading this, I I just kind of wanted to know like a little bit more about yourself. The 
amount of note taking that you did during this period when you were also, you know, deeply embedded in this crunch culture and shipping a thing. Like, is this, yeah, is this kind of just how you are? Do you always come into these new endeavors just like this curious and, and this much of a documentarian? Like, it, obviously, it's a huge favor and a blessing to all of us. <laughs> Lots of folks could have done it. Few, few actually did, you know? Um, I don't, I, I, I definitely wasn't. When, when I moved to California, I was really a fish out of water. I mean, I didn't own a pair of jeans when I moved to California. I was, I was, I was living in corporate America. I was, I was a fish out of water there too. I wasn't exactly, you know, the average, uh, uh, kind of suit kind of guy. But once I got to California, it's like, I knew that this was such, and, and in advertising, you don't get a lot of artistic freedom which is putting it mildly, especially when you're talking corporate circles. So this was an opportunity I didn't want to waste. So I was working just, I was working crazy hours. I mean, minimum 80 hours a week. I mean, just, I, I, and I can say actually easily that I worked longer hours <clears throat> than anyone on the team because I know the next longest hours were uh, Scott Harton, <laughs> uh, uh, Colin Murray was next. Uh, and I just know who came in on weekends and worked late at night and stuff like that. But I, I found a book that the inspiration for writing this came from, uh, the plan updates from the old shooters, all the it software would, you know, that's where a lot of the, the game God developers would make little plan updates, their da daily diaries. And there's that, and there's a book on Riven, the art and the creation of a Riven. And I was a big uh, fan of uh, Mist and uh, Riven, and it was about Cyan and the developers, but I knew they had done it without any of the notes, and it was just a very generic talking about what a game company does and there's no fly on the wall stories yeah, yeah. and i'm thinking you know what and, and, and i found this book by the way because when i walked into team two there's just boxes of garbage laying along the the uh the, the hallways because when people leave or quit they leave all the junk that they don't want and there's toys and figures and old books and old games that they don't want and that's where I found this, this thing on uh, Riven, and I'm going through it. And I'm like, I'm starting out at Blizzard, you know, a Blizzard game. This would be so cool. I actually imagined it would be a web page. Uh, I talked to Mike, and he said, Mike Morheim, and he said that probably a web page would not be, you know, good for the company because, mm -hmm. you know, the PR people. And I realized that there, it also creates kind of like a, the perception because you I don't want all the people to think that only John Stats works on World of Warcraft, which is crazy because yeah. at the time, all the fans thought that, oh, geez, who was the PR guy who went to Blizzard North, Kevin? Um, oh, Bill Roper. Yeah, Bill Roper. Yeah. And we Bill loved Roper it. did everything. Yeah, Bill yeah. Roper did everything because he was That's our sick. PR guy, right? Mm -hmm. And so we didn't mind that. And I didn't yeah. want to be like the one axis, that point of axis, because then all the journalists, everybody wants to interview that one person. Then you get that problem that they had in uh, mm -hmm. Texas, the Game God Syndrome. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I just kept notes. Yeah, and it to how consciously it. we tried to keep that atmosphere where the people right. actually working on the game were not anywhere near the press. Right. That, and such a contrast a to thing. today. Oh you know, my where God, we, times have changed. <laughs> yeah, it's like half the devs are on Twitter and they're much more gettable, you know, for better or worse. Yeah. Yeah, John, you mentioned one thing that's in the book a lot is talking about like how passionate the team was and how much how many hours they put in and like working weekends and stuff and oftentimes people always ask me like what is my favorite time at the studio what what do i like think yeah. about when i think about it it's always really you know it's kind of almost not pc to say but it was a lot of the crunch time you know oh, it yeah. was it was just because you're just like having dinner with the team and it's just a sort of like you're in the trenches sort of feeling oh yeah and camaraderie yeah, exactly. But today, of course, like, you know, crunch is seen as something, you know, and I understand that. And I think everybody doesn't aspire to, you know, make the, the team work extra hours or, or whatever, but it's kind of seen in this negative light. Like, how do you kind of think about that? And yeah, I can see where, boy, it's it, it's kind of different. Like, 
I worked in a non-entertainment industry, advertising, for long enough to appreciate my opportunity to work on, a, you know, either in the movies or on a book or, you know, on a, on a, on a computer game. You're, in, you're working on something that's going into the culture. To work only 40 hours a week is just silly. I mean, to me, and a lot of people who are from Southern California, they grew up with their friends going, oh, someone went to Disney or someone went to, you know, Pixar or something. And you don't get that from Akron, Ohio. You know, nobody goes to Hollywood from Akron, Ohio. Not even, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, it in uh, New York, but really it's, it's, it's so hard to reach. But I just thought that it was just like an opportunity. And I don't know. I, I, I like working long hours anyway, because maybe I'm slow at, at what I do. <laughs> uh, but no, I, 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 Blizzard, at one point, Blizzard stopped us from working more than 40 hours. Yep. I remember that. I think, uh, I can't remember what year, but there, was, uh, uh, there were lawsuits with other companies yep. for, forcing yeah, employees. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. yeah. But and, and that kind of like diffused the thing where, wow, you can't work on the things that you want to work on because you can't work on this stuff at home because unless you're moving art assets to and from home, which is totally insecure. So mm -hmm. it kind of like ruins things. I, I, I would never want to work for a company where it's only 40 hours a week if unless it's, you know something I don't enjoy. Like, yeah, you know. a significant number of people are just built that way. They devote everything for a short period of time and then, you know, rest and then right. go back to it after, you know, a bit. So, and it, and um, it was, you know, it's only like 20, 10 to 20% of the, the company worked long right. hours. I mean, like we had our, our, what, what did they call them? The, the Kevin, they were called like slow burns or something. There is like a, yeah, was it called flex hours or something? Yeah, flex hours. Like, like they, it, they, it wouldn't be crunch time. Crunch time was working late every day, yeah, or, yeah. or at least four days a week. But uh, we started slowly. Like we yeah, like up to Mondays Tuesday, and Wednesday, yeah, yeah, or Tuesday and Thursday, or something like that. And so they kind of like tempered it because they didn't want – Mark and Shane were really conscious of not pushing people too hard because StarCraft was like a, a oh, spirit yeah. breaker for right. them. And I think even doesn't even the science prove that you do get short term gains? Like it's only like two to three weeks before productivity starts to drop immensely. Right. But yeah, so there's there's even a scientific argument that very, very short crunches and two, right. three weeks would be considered an extremely short crunch in game dev. And, um, and it, it but really that can give you, you know, some increased productivity at a time when you might need it. Yeah. And it really matters what you're doing. Like if you enjoy yeah. what you're doing, then you know it's it's yeah. it's fun. You know. Also, if you're trying to be creative, you know, sure, for yeah, sixteen hours a day, it's not going to work. Yeah, but you I think, know, and I think that was like the thing, right? It's because when I joined WoW, you know, I the, I joined the team and the company because I was you know playing the game a lot and kind of was an expert at it and had a lot mm -hmm. of ideas on how to improve it. And so for me, it was like a like a dream come true because I was right. working on a game that was like my favorite game of all time, favorite IP of all time. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed yeah. like surreal. Right. And so, you know, if anything in, in this era, right, like, you know, at the studio at Notorious now that, that we started up, you know, you could work from home. Um, we work from home two days out of the week. And so you can kind of bring your work home with you. And I always kind of right. think about, um, man, if I could have just you know, worked nine to five in, at the office at Blizzard then had the option to just keep working at home, I I would have all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, it would have been, that that would have been bad, right? Like, and, and really like, you know, as Kevin knows, like as a system designer, a game designer, you kind of have the option to like work all the time because you're always trying to like think through ideas. You know, you're yeah. often just working in a Word document or whatever. And so, yeah, this stuff I, occupies your mind. I mean, I yeah. now that I'm in a new job too, and it's like I have sleepless nights again because I'm trying to solve a problem and I can't shut my brain off. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but none of that's like officially on the clock. It's not like, you right. know what I mean? It's like in the Blizzard case, it's not like I'd be punched in while I'm sleeping <laughs> or right. trying desperately to sleep and failing. <laughs> but yeah, so. You do spend the problem though is just like long term, it's just not sustainable for a lot of people. Right. Like if you look at a lot of the old devs, there's 
tremendous amounts of burnout. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's the part we haven't figured out, you know, is how to do it long-term, uh, especially for people like you and I, John, or Chris, that have worked on one project for a decade or more, you know, yeah, it's just like, I know that, that kneeling, that need for freshness and something new to wrap your brain around. There were all these new challenges, but yeah, I think you were there. Maybe you were there or they just mentioned you, but I think in a meeting we had with Frank Pierce, I think he mentioned you or talked about how you had been on the project long enough that it was, he felt it was his responsibility to manage, you know, that problem to give you fresh opportunities so that you didn't burn out and that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then shortly after that, you were gone. <laughs> so like he didn't yeah. do a great job, <laughs> but uh, kind of dropped yeah. the ball. But I remember him talking about that and being like, yeah, hundred percent. That is something, you know, that is part of leadership's job is, you know, like you mentioned how Shane and Mark were very cognizant of it. And that's, yeah, that's a great thing because people will work themselves to death in some cases. And sure. It's just yeah. not, yeah, it's not long-term viable. So. Yeah, I also kind of want to ask you, John, like, can you imagine, and I know, Kevin, you're like doing this now, right, is working from home. Like, how yeah. do you think about, because, you know, so much of the book and so much of the story is camaraderie inside the office and just the hallway conversations and just, mm -hmm. you know, that culture that just can come out of that. Like, how do you compare that to like working from home now? Because so many studios now are just like full remote. And, yeah. you know, I couldn't imagine myself becoming the designer I am today for remote, but yeah, just right. curious what you guys think. Yeah, there's definitely, you, there is something missing for sure. You get other benefits like work-life balance is a lot more manageable, but I, you know, I think um, a lot of the, a lot of the work is being done by people that have an inordinate amount of time to spend on it. Right. Like, oh yeah, you, you can talk about the visionary who sets the tone, but there's still in reality just a lot of people punching in numbers and information and creating content, right? And hopefully it's all in support of whatever vision, but yeah, you just need a lot of people grinding, you know? And a lot of that grind is done by a younger sort of all-in generation that doesn't have the family to go home to and would only be playing video games if they got off early, right? That kind of thing. Yeah, there's, um, there's a different mentality. I mean, it depends yeah. on whether or not you have a family. Right, I mean, but a, I was that person you know, when sure. I started, and then I stopped being that person as my kids came and started coming out. Yep, but, yep. Um, yeah, so, but I, I do think, like, yeah, a lot of that work is just being done by a generation that wants to be all in, and that's, in, you know, that's inclusive of, like, being next to and in the physical proximity of everyone else that's all in and that's harder to accomplish full remote. So, well, it, it's kind of funny. I mean, I will not even, I will not purport to understand what's going on. I saw your, your previous podcast was on, Oh geez. Uh, and this, this is where my ignorance of games are going. Uh, that, that your previous Elden podcast, Ring. Elden Ring. Yes. Uh, I, I play, uh, I, I'm on a, uh, 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 Paizo uh, Pathfinder podcast every week, and they're talking about nice. Elden Ring, and uh, yeah, we talk about whatever the the good shows are, whether whatever the good games are, and they're talking about Elden Ring. I was talking, uh, I don't know, Kevin, do you remember Matt Malizia? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so Matt's a oh, he's a he is such a great guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I I recently talked to him six months ago. He uh he's back home. He's working at home. He's doing a mm -hmm. uh, sandbox game that okay. uh it's a it's a it's an RPG. You're by yourself, and you know it's it's he's procedurally creating. He's spending twenty minutes per art asset, right? And so and he's he was so super fast to start out with, but he's doing and this is an RPG. I mean it. Mm -hmm. He showed me some screenshots, and that looks great. He's the only guy doing it. He's using the Unreal Engine. I don't know mm -hmm. which Unreal Engine, but he's doing absolutely everything himself, and he's just using a lot of uh, uh, procedural world creation tools for height maps and, oh, my God, all kinds of right. crazy stuff. But he's by himself. It's yeah. one guy making an RPG, and it yeah. looks, it looks honestly, it's, it's probably... It's definitely better than vanilla WoW looking. Uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. know really how WoW looks now, but it's lush, it's gorgeous, and nice. you know he's building off. He's building on top of a known genre that's a proven genre. 
So who knows if he'll be successful, but this is just one guy working by himself. Yeah. So he's such a he's such a great example of what yeah, what we're talking about because I remember, you know, when we were discussing what kinds of battlegrounds we were going to do in WoW. And he, like many of us, you know, during lunchtime, was obsessed with League of Legends. Like, we'd be playing, yeah. or Dota, you know, we'd be playing um, basically the early MOBAs um, back then. And he was like, I'll stay weekends. I, we should we should build yep, a MOBA <laughs> as a battleground, right? Yep, I'll build that thing myself, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, look, calm down, right? Like, <laughs> I can't just tell you to go make that, right? We at first would figure out how that would work and all that, you know? But you um, know what? <laughs> I love the idea. And, and obviously, uh, obviously, Ultrack Valley was an attempt at doing just that. But yeah, right. he was such a perfect example of a guy who just... He just zipped in and he said, I'm here. I will die for this cause. I will work every ounce of my life, oh. you know, to make the things I want to make a reality so I can see these things come to life. And like well, so many of us, you know, we were just so excited about that's you know, making the best game possible. So War, War Song Gulch came from him. I mean, right. I saw him making like he saw Ultrack Valley. And he said, mm -hmm. that's not going to work. And so right. you, you talk about somebody who just sits down and decides to do things. He and I are kindred spirits in that. I, mm -hmm. we, I, I mean, I never seek uh, uh, permission. It's easier to ask right. for forgiveness, right? That's right? So, I mean, and you know, I, I described like the things that I ninjaed into World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. Warsong War Gulch was one of them. He, he, the two of us put Warsong Gulch together without right. the designers even knowing. <laughs> right. Like, like when, 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 when Kaplan and uh, Tom Chilton saw that we were working on an alternative PvP map, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they were pretty nervous about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they were really we nervous. This. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> more high, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, they were, <laughs> they were not happy when they actually right. saw that. But... Uh, yeah, you, yeah, like, hey, you want to have PvP and no capture the flag? What are you crazy? Like, I know, I know. It's a cornerstone. It was, yeah, <laughs> right, we just we'll went, do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so, like, and when they can, and, and when Tom and, and and Jeff start seeing other team members rally around the capture right. the flag map, it's like, oh yeah, okay. Sometimes you know the leaders follow the crowd. You know. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the kind of person I think that you know has to be very represented in projects that yeah. you know, like wow ended up being and there's no yeah. policy that is going to fit everybody right. i mean some exactly. people you, you have to have jobs for people who have families i mean mm -hmm. okay you just have to i mean you, the industry would drive up dry up and shrivel right. without those people you know but you yeah. have to have a system that's flexible for the you know the map militias out there right. who are just going to come out of the blue with oh here's 20 times more art assets than you thought that's you'd right. ever even have. And right. here's the whole plan. But yeah. Yeah. Cause trying right. to legislate away from allowing crazy people to do crazy things just means all that the art that we end up with ends up pushing towards that mediocre point. You know what right. I mean? And, and so and, you have to allow those people to be crazy sometimes to make crazy stuff happen. And that's one of the reasons why I work by myself. <laughs> it's, it's, I, can't tell me what to do. That's right. it's like, I thought the problem was working for someone else, making them money. Then I'm like, okay, I got into business. Now I'm, well, it's working with other people is the problem. Right. So that's now right. my, my, I'm just a one man guy. And if I want to decide to work, make, do a board game, I work on a board game. And when that board game inspires a story for the past two and a half years, I've been writing uh, fantasy novels based mm -hmm. on the board game that I haven't released yet. So <laughs> that's right. That's, that's just right. the way you follow your I passion. Love I love it. Going back to to your work and your passion, um, I I was really curious to see what it's like or what the what the way a level designer thinks about the world is, how you perceive things, and um, because I don't I don't know exactly how established the discipline was uh, at the time. But it seems like you were still fairly early on in terms of figuring out this space, especially in like a shared MMO world. So, you, you know, you talked about like your dungeon design being influenced by um, spaces in your memory sometimes, um, which reminds me of like this old 
Miyamoto anecdote where he would talk about, you know, playing in caves near the river and that's where Zelda sort of, you know, came from. But like when ah. you walk into a room or a new environment um, when traveling or, or, or places that you take inspiration from, like what sort of things do you notice? Like what do you bring back to the level design table from your lived experience? It's it's kind of funny. It, it, it's honestly, sometimes it's shape. I remember uh, the original inspiration for the Warsong Gulch design. Uh, the Warsong Gulch came from a first-person shooter uh, level that I did twice for Quake 3 and Quake 2. And that came from a courthouse. I, I did jury duty once in New York City. And just waiting to be called, I'm looking out the window, and I see this. It's... You want to look at this? Uh, it's it's they they redid the facade, of course, because it looked like they called it the Darth Vader of courthouses, and it was the courthouses for it was like the court of family services. You know, it's the worst situation you go to court for is when you have parents arguing for kids, but the facade of the building just had the, these weird. Um, uh, diamond shaped uh, pillars, and it just looked and they it was an ugly design. It was a, it, it looked like Darth Vader. The mask of Darth Vader is what the the building looked like. But just it can be anything. <sighs> Jeez, my inspiration on it usually comes from if I'm not pulling from real world things. Like I've been through mm -hmm. caves. I I love Mammoth Caves. That's out here in uh, Kentucky uh, near Ohio. I, I, I do Dungeons and Dragons. I draw from my experience making modules at home uh, when I was a junior high school and grade school and in high school. I would make lots of Dungeons and Dragons modules, and that's just working on graph paper. Most level designers don't have that, actually. Um, they're, uh, they're, 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 it's a more art background. I think for first-person shooters, it's closer to design more than art, but... Mm. It's really, you want to make an interesting environment that has variation in terrain. You want ups and downs. You want interesting silhouettes in your, in your doorways or what have you. It really comes from everything, and you have to be an architecture nerd. I, I still go to skyscraper forums. Uh, I, I, a lot of my Facebook things have uh, architecture, you know, you're drawing from uh, European architecture a lot. A lot of cool stuff is being done in China, but you just have to love uh, shape and form. So, yeah, so you still really keep current. I didn't know that skyscraper forms were a thing until just now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a sub cool. Oh, yeah. NIMBY. <laughs> Those are Vandalay doing these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, John, you, you talk in the book, you know, you describe level design as just, it's basically, it's just, you're, you're someone that just moves shit around, I think is like something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's my said. job description. I move things yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, but I think what was unique, I think now after coming out of Blizzard and kind of exposing myself to kind of the, the broader industry is that the level designer on WoW is kind of unique in that they're kind of expected to do, because typically like a level designer in the industry is just someone who just does blockouts, really, usually. Usually. Um, and then the environment artist is the person who kind of places right. assets and beautifies it. But the Blizzard level designer was kind of like a hybrid of the two. How did it, and I've heard like Pardo was kind of influential in like deciding, you know, was the level designer more of an artist or a designer and, you know, one under design. But um, yeah, what, how do you think that came to be? Like the level designer team was that kind of hybrid of, of basically an environment artist and a level designer. That's a pretty nuanced question. That's a really good question. I don't usually get that when I'm talking to uh, <laughs> interviewers. You know, they'll ask, "What are what is computer games?" You know, um, <laughs> so a level designer. I, I I think of myself as the first person shooter generation of level designer, where you're the person blocking it out is also the person doing the artwork. And and the reason why I like this school of thought is that it takes a long time to build 3D levels. Very long time. And while you're doing it, you're going to have ideas come to your head while you're working. And Roughly, it can take about two months to four months 
a really fast level is like six weeks. So we're talking months on a single file. And when you break it apart between a blockout artist and a, a, a traditional artist, like artistically, I'm not as strong as your average Blizzard artist. But because I'm constantly working on the file, I'm going to see opportunities that will have design implications. I'll see, oh, here's another path to get players from A to B. Or here's, uh, these two rooms are next to each other. We can punch a hole between them and make a window. And maybe there's some vantage that I can take them to that really give them this awe-inspiring you know, vista to look at. You don't have that freedom when somebody blocks out a level. Blizzard actually did uh, 2D blockouts. Um, and I, I actually don't respect that, that approach uh, I think we went that way after Vanilla WoW. Uh, we went to the more I call the more flowchart dungeons, where it's mostly hallways. I don't I don't do hallways. Two boxes, what they would call it. Yeah, I don't do hallways. And and if you look at my uh, designs for uh, there's a whole list of uh, I basically did half the dungeons in Vanilla WoW and ninety percent of the micro dungeons, the the, the non instance dungeons. So. I don't do hallways in my in in, in my dungeons because hallways are actually pretty uh, boring. There's no sp- sense of place to a hallway. Uh, hallways are it, I don't know. They're just, just it's it's too easy. It's it's linear. There's no decisions for the players to make. And WoW dungeons turned into nothing but hallways with a big round room at the end of it, and it just feels artificial for me. But that is what happens when some guy is blocking out in you know, Adobe Illustrator, handing that to the art team. The art team doesn't have the flexibility to say, oh, why don't we just stack these rooms on top of one another? Because that way we could look through the grate through the floor and we'd get this double, you know, uh, double reusing geometry to create different things to look at, uh, d- different relationships between one room and another. So... Yeah, there is, there's kind of like two schools of thoughts. The problem with the way I do it is that there's very few people who do it the way I do it. It's kind of the guys that grew up with Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, I've noticed that in, in the, the dungeon department where, where I was working, I was the only one who started out with graph paper and could actually use graph paper effectively to compute to communicate my ideas or design things. The other guys would just like, kind of like feel for the way things are. Uh, So yeah. And believe me, the hard, the single hardest part about making an MMO is dungeons. And that's technologically, it's very hard and it's very hard to hire people into that role. At least 20 years ago, we're talking. So so when you did the levels on WoW, were you in... Because you know, at, at, at some point, I, I don't know when it happened, but there's like a dungeon team. And they're pretty much like, you know, they would do yeah. WMO artists or whatever. Yes. So Versus the level designers who would do like exterior, right? And so yeah. you, today, if you would say on the WoW team, level designer, they're talking about the exterior level design, right? right? That makes sense. Whereas, um, you know... I, uh, and so I think the exterior level designers pretty much never do like actual dungeons. No. And it's more of like the dungeon artists do. And so it is like more WMO. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah. yeah it's a, when did that transition happen? Were you in it? Well, it's 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 kind of funny. I mean, we it's a totally different set of skills, like to 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 sprinkle on terrain. I, I would call actually the level I would call them landscape designers. If, if, if I could go back in time and change something, because yeah. that describes really what they're doing. And maybe the dungeon department, that makes sense. Uh, they never were a shared. It's a completely different skill set. Um, you need a heavy, heavy art background for a uh, architecture uh, to, to understand that type of, you know, uh, geometry. Yeah, it, it's I think there was a lot of confusion between when you say level designer, <laughs> we'd always have to say exterior level designer or interior level designer. Those were the yeah. distinctions that we used. And that's such a mouthful <laughs> that uh, I, I'm sure at some point they said, let's just call it the dungeon team. And that made sense. 
uh, probably when we moved to the new campus in 2006 or something. That's, that's probably when that happened. Were you involved with Blackrock Depths at all? Yeah, that when I did was... all, yeah, I did all the Blackrock Dungeons, um, Blackrock Depths, but Upper and way, Lower. Mm-hmm. To me, and I say this a lot, but Blackrock Depths is probably one of the best dungeons in any game ever. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and but naturally, that includes the entrance, you know? Oh, which yeah. is right like the giant rocks suspended by the chains held by the dwarves that whole area of the interior mountain which obviously leads to a lot of areas but yeah that whole thing is just such a masterpiece thank and you i know a lot of people that i talk to that visit my stream feel the same way like it's my favorite dungeon too yeah yeah and, and, and the funny thing is like some of the things you did in brd that make it exceptional are some of the simplest techniques right but they have so much power and you don't see as often anymore, which boggles, right? Because like the door at the beginning that you need a key for and you can't open when you first step in, right? Like right. just mind blowing. Oh, I got to yeah. find that key. I got, I'm so excited about what's behind that gate. You know, like and, and, it's and, so simple. Like when we talk about it, we're like, well, of course you do that. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, well, yeah, and I can't even take sense. credit. See, I can't even <laughs> take credit for that because at that oh, really? point, okay. Uh, that's all the quest designers. They decided Mm -hmm. that, Oh, uh, let's put a gate here. You know, that gate was added after, um, we're talking about the gate between the prison area and the, 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 like like the main entrance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Like that was, and I knew that they would have, there would be doorways to make Mm -hmm. this somewhat linear. Um, but black rock deaths had just, Oh, that took a lot of time to make. That was probably yeah. a four-month-long dungeon. But again, like my original vision for that was so much simpler. And yeah. as I'm working this, I'm going, huh, prison makes mm-hmm. sense next to the gladiator. Right. And if you've got gladiators, you have, you know, have, a, you have an arena, which kind of makes sense. I could actually connect that to the city. Mm-hmm. So there's some like relationship. So when you can have that type of uh, progression of belonging, right. like things like you can't have the library next to the slaughterhouse, you know, it just doesn't, <laughs> right. it doesn't make any sense. But, and, and but yeah, like you speak, you, you speak to the elements of that came straight sure. from your background in Dungeons and Dragons, because that's how a lot of those modules were built was, yep. Let's let's create an ecology here. Let's create a community here. Let's create a place where real people or real things live and interact and yeah, you know, like and they polish it, you know, usually. And then yeah, so it's like that's and that's exactly what BRD feels like when you go and play it, which is just like this giant, you know, D and D adventure that you spend a night running all over the place and doing <laughs> yeah. all kinds of crazy things. Many right? hours, many hours yeah. running around. <laughs> and and it's funny about BRD is that the last three rooms the from the Lyceum, everybody's favorite room, the Lyceum, <laughs> and the throne room were tacked on. The, the Actually, the original boss room was where the – it was overlooking the cavern with the bridge with the lava flow in the background. I forget mm-hmm. who you're fighting there. It's, it was a big uh, – like a, Is it Incendius? Uh, no. it was, it was like a salamander kind of guy. It was, it was, I don't think it was a fire elemental. It was the guy that looked like, uh, Oh, the Lucifron types. Yeah. 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 The Lucifron yeah. guys. Um, that was the boss room. And then Jeff figured out, Oh, you could skip a whole bunch of content. You know, like he figured out how to cheese the dungeon. He says, Oh, we just not have to make it a little bit longer. And at this point I had be- built Black Rock Mountain. Lower Black Rock Spire, Upper Black Rock Spire, which not my, one of my favorite dungeons, but uh, then Black Rock Depths. I was out of ideas for for rooms for dwarf Dark Iron Dwarves, That's and so, so I just had copy and pasting pillars 
uh, symmetrical rooms. You will not see that in many of my dungeons, but that is a literally a designer who's working on fumes without any <laughs> ideas, just copy and paste. And thank God the uh, the. And what's funny is that I remember Jeff Goodman and uh, Jeff Kaplan like, we love the Lyceum. It's the best yeah. room ever. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. really? That was like the room that took me like. Eight hours to build. Your fumes <laughs> are still better. Than yeah, like one of my like worst those. room. It's the uh, it's the least interesting room I think visually. It's flat. It doesn't have windows into anything else. It's not connected to anything. Mm -hmm. It there's no sense of purpose to the place, right. and uh, that's where they found out where there's good gameplay. So that's kind of like where you need the whole team uh, working, yep. you know, on the same thing. And the, just the scope, too, like the dungeons made back then, which you brought a lot of that, to that sense of scope and scale that makes players, and this was so important as, as part of a regular thing in WoW, just reminding players how insignificant they are right? yeah. <laughs> in terms of like the story and just everything, right? And that you have to fight for significance at all times. Okay. And so rounding that bend into Blackrock Chamber, where you know, where you, you look up and you're just... You're high level at that point. You're like, yeah. <laughs> you've conquered so much of the game, and yet yeah. you walk into that chamber and you're like, oh my god, I'm nothing again. <laughs> like, look at the size and the scope and the scale yeah. of this whole thing. I'm going to be running on the chains, and the things in here are going to completely kick my ass again. And and then oh. you go through and you you get to back to work and you fight your way through to feeling significant and accomplishing things. But like, yeah, well, just that constant reminder. And a lot of that is because of the the level design, you know, the, yeah, the, the vistas, yeah. you know, that you see. So yeah, just mind blowingly good. And it's a fight with the programmers to, to, to have a room that size. We didn't, you know, I, I looked at, the, I, t I, I, I got, uh, Scott Harton was the engine programmer and he and I worked together a lot of times and he knew I would push the envelope every time. That's what a good level designer does. And I thought, how big can a room be? Like, what's our minimum far clip that will not like the? I wanted a room so big that it, the whole thing would draw. You don't want the far clip too, so it's clipping out. So he gave me the thing, and that's how. That's why Black Rock uh, Mountain is so big on the inside. I wanted to see, you know, if I could do that, but it's sometimes you have to pull the programmers into accepting that yes it's okay to have a room this big or so the, the programmers are the dwarves that are struggling to hold that thing together <laughs> yeah 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 and, and even bill petrus was like he didn't like the chains idea he wanted a mm -hmm. he wanted a bridge going over because he didn't understand how uh the players would un he you know, figure it out. Yeah. yeah, figure it out. And it's like, you know, unless you play MMOs, you don't really understand what a high level player's, you know, what, mm -hmm. what that mentality is. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's 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 a legitimate concern if you don't know that stuff. Right. But right. these are the conversations that we had to have to make that room, you know, right. the way it is. Yeah, and if if uh there had been a bridge, then people wouldn't have been wandering around the ledges and Right. Jumping and getting snowballed into lava, you know, <laughs> mind controlled into lava. So. <laughs> oh, and yeah, it feels like real battleground. <laughs> oh yeah, and and I wanted them to feel like they were sneaking into a place that they weren't supposed to be. Like if there's exactly. just like a bridge yep. with little flags and little statues on either right. side, big sign pointing dungeon this way, you yeah, know, that's right. it's, insert it sword for XP. Yeah. <laughs> it ruins the immersion, which is kind of like what you're going for uh, yeah. when it comes to level design. That that's that's what you always want is immersion. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, if you've played any Elden Ring at all. We don't always talk about it on this podcast, but in the last month we do. Uh, I, I kind of went off on a tangent last week about this one fantastic outdoor legacy dungeon called Stormvale Castle at the end of the first zone gave me major BRD vibes in that I nice. just kept, disc not because aesthetically it resembles it at all, but just because I, I felt like, wait, there's more, wait, there's more, yeah, like that door so nice. so here. Good. Oh my God, that, that door opens so here and then there's another cellar and then it goes out to a cliff and you're just like, you know, it's that, it's the same feeling of when you think of BRD and there's the person who goes, you know, knows that there's actually like 13 optional bosses and you're like, wait, what the, I had no fucking idea, you know, and it's not, it's not neat. It doesn't do the thing that 
at some point I just noticed WoW Dungeons kind of started doing where I don't remember what the first dungeon that did it was, but it felt like a real design shift to finish the boss and then you just walk off a ledge that happened to be right above the entrance and you're out. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I I really just, in retrospect, kind of disliked that. Uh, and, and Elden Ring has, you know, like level design or at least game game design as it interacts with it has advanced to the point where you you know you're not doing the full brd run every time you die if you wipe in a in a catacomb in elden ring but there's there is kind of like an aesthetic coherence to at least just having a little sort of strand of a teleporter that takes you back to the beginning of the dungeon uh, as right. opposed to literally just walking off a ledge and thinking, well, that's convenient. They built this whole catacomb so I could just <laughs> run a loop, yeah. you know, like that was nice of them. Yeah, it's a trade off. That's that's Jeff Kaplan. He uh, he he wanted to he, he's he's an advocate for the players who are doing dungeons every single night and okay. yeah you know it's 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 a trade-off like you can't and that's that's the problem with mmos you know you've got one audience that wants to feel the immersion they want to feel the surprise and the you know uh the the story and then you know 90 percent of the audience audience just wants the object at the end of the dungeon like when you talk about dungeons you're not talking about the architecture you're talking about the drops of the boss that's that's 90 percent of the conversations yes. at yep. minimum so it's kind of funny like the the object creations like uh jeez uh, uh john uh, john you and uh uh, uh travis <laughs> day making the objects they're they're the item designers. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about dungeons. If you're a player for most of the for most of the uh, the time, but yeah, like as far as like the art and the immersion, um, yeah, it's it's you can't make everybody happy. I think it's a good point. You know, some fun trivia is um, you know Kevin when we interviewed Ian, you know Ian Haskasas, who's now the game director of, of WoW, of course. Uh, we asked him, you know, what's your favorite dungeon? And he did say BRD. But at the time, I think the, the, those, uh, the group that interviewed him didn't like that answer because at the time, WoW was sort of shifting from, you know, the longer dungeon crawl experience that BRD was to more of something more like the lunchtime dungeon that you just, oh, yeah. kind Scar of what you're talking Scarlet yeah. Monastery. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. That's what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah, so it is. It, it it was kind of indicative to me of like sort of the shift of sensibilities and kind of like how mm -hmm. the game was changing over time to be, you know, more streamlined and kind of like what you're talking about, John, where it's like it's a means to an end of loot, right? right. So yeah, but and and yeah, I always thought of dungeons as you know something you spend a night doing, right? Like. It takes you half that night just to put the group together. That was the <laughs> challenge. Yeah. Of BRD, but, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah but uh, you know, once you got it, like you stuck with that group and you and lived sure with all have... their their shitty play or whatever. Oh. Um, and then, but you you made a night of it, you know. And and at the end of your experience, like most dungeons were meant to be played just a handful of times, and then you move on to the next thing. So yeah. there was still that sense of exploration. Like most of the people playing through that dungeon most of the time hadn't like fully um, looped it, you know, 50 times or whatever they do in, in like sort of modern MMOs now. Right. Which all the exploration is gone. Everyone's an expert on the terrain. Like yeah. if you're showing up for the first time, you're a pariah because you don't know the loop. You don't know the bosses. Right. right? Like you get more people feeling that way more of the time because it's designed to only be done a handful of times. And I think the experience, you know, like goes up. But yeah, we shifted to loot delivery systems rather than like game player, you know, artistic experience or exploration right. experience type things. And, and and honestly, we started from a really cockeyed uh, trajectory. Anyway, we were we were basing our dungeon sizes on Vanilla WoW on the paradigm of EverQuest. There's no such thing as a dungeon too big, because in EverQuest you're fighting other players for every spawn. You're fighting. You're That's you're right. competing with, and so. The theory was just when in doubt, make the dungeon bigger. Just make it bigger, make it bigger, make it bigger. And mm -hmm. I'm so glad. It's kind of funny. I talked to Scott Mercer uh, a few years ago, and he like really sheepishly admitted that they had to make the Wailing Caverns 
smaller. They cut out the maze section, which was right. just the sec. I mean, I just couldn't believe they kept asking me to make that dungeon bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and when they finally cut, and he's apologizing for having cut out the maze section. And I was like, thank God. God, that was just the worst. That was, it was a nightmare to work on. To, yeah. I mean, it was all when you're it, you talk about being out of gas as far as ideas. You know, we hadn't any mazes in World of Warcraft, and I was like, right. "Is a maze bad?" And Jeff was like, shrugs his shoulders. He goes, "I don't know. Maybe it's good. We'll find that's out." What, yeah, that's what I absolutely love. Is that all those things were just put in. We tried everything, and to some extent, some percentage of the population loved it. Right? Yeah. Like for some, Wailing Caverns is their favorite dungeon because yeah. it's maze-like, and because you can take wrong turns and you can fall and lose a bunch of progress and like being a master of that dungeon is a whole different like sort of thing, you know, yeah. that some people are super proud of. Um, yeah. And then there's just a lot of people who are like, screw that dungeon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the monastery. Right. But yeah, there's something in there for such a wide variety of people to adore and right. make their favorite. Yeah. So, so John, the way that we do things on the podcast is uh, at some point we open the floor and let the, uh, the people who um, the audience ask questions and come up to the stage and ask questions. But before we do that, I do want to ask you, since um, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but at some point I spun out of Blizzard and um, we're, we started our own studio called Notorious, and we're working on our first game now. And you know, many of us have come from WoW and the WoW team and are big fans of WoW. And you know, one thing I think a lot about. Now, in our early years, I mean, now I'm thinking like, oh, shit, we don't document anything because like you were talking about. But um, <laughs> but also is like, what is the best way to make a game? Right. And I still think it's still the, the studio and the and the game development team is still relatively like a young kind of thing compared to like, say, Hollywood or whatnot. Right. But I always I always tell people, you know, when I first started at Blizzard, I felt like I had more autonomy and freedom to put things into the game than I did my last year. Right. You know, because over time they just added so much more process and you had to have consensus with your right. team to put stuff in and whatnot. But in the early years, it was just kind of like, no, you you know, you had this trust to just put stuff in. I mean, you didn't have like a full license to just like delete the warrior or anything like that. But yeah, you know, you had a lot of freedom, right? And yeah, could you maybe like talk about like the process of putting stuff in the game and yeah, and sort of thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, now, as far as like uh, a formal game design, I mean, I can tell you like my board game. I, starting from scratch, I like y you have to be, in my opinion, you have to be self-publish, funding your own project. You can work on it until it's ready. You know, until it's done. Uh, if you do have a publisher, you don't have the freedom to explore, you know, fertile ground that you never knew. And it's, this is, again, like my theory on uh, level design. It's as you're working on a game for how many years, you're going to find out, oh, there's this really cool thing that can really blow out gameplay. But if you're not budgeted for that thing, you know... If you're not self-published or you don't have a good relationship with your publisher, you don't have that freedom. But I look at, I, I want to start with gameplay that works. And it's the old Blizzard adage, uh, you, you, you keep what works and you fix what doesn't work. And as far as board game designs, I looked at RPGs. This is uh, uh, the, the board game I, I've been working on. And I looked at the number of rules uh, and and... I, I find out what are the flaws in RPGs, like tabletop RPGs, uh, board game RPGs. And it rules is the number one thing. There's just way too many rules. And I'm like, okay, if, if there are too many rules, what are, you, you, you kind of just, you're, you're reverse engineering. You're starting with an RPG and you're reverse engineering. You're taking away the things that don't work. Okay, it's they're too long to play. Why are they taking too long? Well, it's because there's too many rules. And then you look at the rules of an RPG, and this is just my thought process going through uh, my, my own game, but uh, that's kind of like my process. Uh, and, you know, you solve the rules. Like, I find uh, placement, the grid of 
little figures on that is what is causing all the rules. When you have spatial relationships between the monster and the player, when you have, when you have, you have to have distances, engagement rules, and it just bogs people down because when you look at this is kingdom monster death was the inspiration for this because it's a, a crazy rule book. It's a crazy board game, terrible board game design. Um, but there's all these rules, and it, it boils down to Pathfinder and Dungeons and & Dragons. The monster always gets their attack in anyway. So why are we worrying about player placement? Uh, you know, Attacks of opportunity are slow things down. Yes, they're kind of fun, but you just kind of like work with that type of... Um, I guess, is, is that kind of like a good answer to like... What you mean as far as like uh, how do you design yeah, I mean, a game? Is that- yeah, I mean you're like you're just saying focus on what matters, right? But yeah, um, you know one one thing that some 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 kind of uh, conversation I had with some guys on on our team was, you know, when we first started, they're like, well, we're we should make a design document for the whole game and like detail everything out, and I was like, well, you know. I, no, I couldn't no. remember ever there being a WoW design no, document. No, I know there was time. maybe total one, waste but of time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Total waste of time. I mean, if if the game is done, sure, yeah, I mean, but the, first of all, the game should explain itself, I mean, to a new player. So uh, there, there's no instructional value of a design document. Every game I've worked on, even after World of, uh, uh, World of Warcraft and other companies, as soon as you put something on a uh what do they call it the intro wiki. yeah yeah like yeah like the internal wiki as soon as somebody digitizes an image and they put it up in the wiki it's already out of date somebody just walked into somebody's office and said no nope, we you know the animator said that's too expensive we're gonna have to cut that you know and now you've got an out of date wiki and you've got once people realize that your wiki is out of date or your design doc is out of date, they start going. They stop going to it for information. They they realize they just get. I'll get out of my chair and walk into the designer's office or call them on the phone and find out. Hey, do we still have orcs? You know, or whatever the question is. You know, um, yeah. Design documents are just uh, yeah, or it, it becomes it, it, some it, sacred cow that people it helps. can never be evolved or changed or. It helps it's you organize have to things. Do. Yeah, it helps you organize. Like, it's funny when when I showed Eric Dodds my, the, the the Wow Diary, the the advanced reader copy of it. He he showed me a, a, a box, a cardboard box with all the printouts of all the documents that he made on World of Warcraft, and mm-hmm. it was about. I would say I don't know what twelve hundred, fourteen hundred pages looks like. Yeah. It's about. 18 inches tall yeah. uh, of printouts. And that's he just me one of those. On that's the first day. That's yeah. So here's the design document. I never read it. <laughs> right. I, I, I know. I know. There's no reason to. <laughs> but, but I mean, like what he would, do, and he's not dumb either. He knows right. that that's just stuff that I throw stuff like when I'm writing books, I'll just throw ideas at a Word document. And then, you know, every once in a while, I'll read the Word document and go, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to, that clicks, that connects with this thing here. It's great for self organization, but as a as a tool for communication, it's a zero. It's a zero. That is that is a hot take. Plus nobody, yeah, plus <laughs> nobody wants to do it ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my horrible. problem. As I just hated documentation. It's it is it is very useful for future designers that can yeah. speak the language. Maybe so. Right? Yeah, maybe like so. Not players, players can't speak the language. But I think the pace of development has to like settle down you know before it's applicable i had a job at bungie where i remember one week we all switched to confluence and the all whole audio department was basically given a mandate to just document what they did in the in the wiki for like just that week and i still get pages from people five years later telling me dude i just stumbled upon your wiki page and like it's saving my butt right now and so oh, i feel like wow. there there is and i'm like that's insane that they haven't you know updated their tech for triggering those types of sounds in five years like why are you talking to me but it also <laughs> is like i think there there can come a point in the dev cycle especially if you plan on expanding contracting where the documentation is like super useful oh but yeah when you're raw making the game i mean for sure like 
I get I get anxiety looking at a list of to do's I generated last week that already don't make sense sometimes. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's difficult. I, I wanted to ask uh, a little bit about Chris Metzen and kind of working under like the Metzen School of Art because you, you had a quote in your book about you know how when he would uh, give a character a war uh, an axe in a concept sketch he wouldn't just stick an axe in their hand you know he'd decorate the weapon and weather it with nicks and dents from battles past. I've heard some Blizzard friends talk about this real full scale commitment to the lore and all the context before like there was. I mean, Chris probably remembers, but someone was sharing a story about uh, someone had created kind of like a little village for dotting the map in, in Frostfire Ridge and Warlords of Drainer. And they said that Metzen basically saw it and more or less just said, like, that's not how orc villages work. You know, like he would just look at it and he just knew that like the orcs wouldn't have done it this way. They would have put X here and Y here. I'm just kind of wondering, like, what was it like to work in a system where one person kind of held so many of those key nuances and details that could just kind of like trickle down and, and affect what you were doing, if you could just kind of riff for a bit. And I, I know Chris had some stuff he wanted to ask too. Oh yeah. That it's, it's, that is ideal. When you have one person to go to the, the worst is when you have multiple people to go to, because then you don't get answers. You don't get a, person that's going to say, oh, that's not how orcs would build. You know, uh, the worst thing is like, we're not sure how orcs are going to build. Uh, Kevin was working on that. I don't know. Maybe he's, you know, I don't know what, when he's going to come up with it, but yeah, just put a pin in that for now. That is the worst answer to give to a creative team. Uh, but no, I love Metz. I, I loved working with Chris Metzen. I mean, he was, he is unequivocal. You know, he'd, he'd usually give, if it was cool, thumbs up. It usually got the thumbs up from uh, Chris Metzen. Um, and he had that idea where he could be flexible with things. Uh, there's only one time, and I, I found out even after WoW shipped, that there was a big row about the Undercity not being... Um, just grungy and dingy and sprawling. He wanted a really sprawling design for Undercity. And they put everything together, and I just, uh, uh, I can't believe that there was this big uh, row between Metzen and the, uh, the the artists who built the Undercity. And I was in the room with the guys who built the Undercity, and I didn't know. But um, it ended up with Metzen going, you know what? You guys are totally right. This is a better way to do the, the, the dungeon, so to do the city. So, yeah, he, he, I thought he was a great uh, creative director. Quick question yeah. about um, art. You know, as you know, there's Metzen's kind of art and design and Sammy's and others. Yeah. But then if you look at, like, World of Warcraft's actual art and engine, it's kind of different. And so how did that kind of, like, process work of, like, say, synthesizing the Warcraft art styles? You know, and Metzen and Sammy's are a little different, perhaps. Right. Sure. Um, and putting that into engine, like, how did that process happen? And, you know, did any of them get kind of, you know, annoyed that their kind of, you know, style wasn't put into engine? What's well, kind of funny, their style is born on the restriction of 64 pixels for a unit in World, you know, in uh, Warcraft 2. You know, that's, that's the size of art for an orc walking. They have to have these big, thick, meaty hands and exaggerated, like the, the entire exaggerated proportions comes from the RTS game where you've got lots of little units to just parse what's going on you can't have a human with normal portions you wouldn't see their legs you wouldn't see their arms and so their art style was just comes from the the medium that they're working in they weren't super married to that art style but by the time wow was coming around everybody was like like you got, oh that's their style let's try to do the warcraft style in 3d and there's a lot of failures like a lot of uh, uh hyper realism um stuff that you would never imagine until we got uh brandon idol uh was an artist from oh geez i can't i can't remember if he came from epic or not but he had the look of 
He he did the uh, the knoll and the kobold were the two creatures with exact bug eyes, big slobbering tongue, you know, bright colors, exaggerated proportions. And it wasn't quite Warcraft 2 or Warcraft 3, but there's an homage there being made. And I think nowadays they're even further away from Brandon's look where there's not a lot of exaggerations. Nothing's tilted or wonky or, you know, just disproportionately, you know, haphazard like we were tr- that was the look we were kind of going for but no it's just our uh, interpretation of like okay so this is the the warcraft franchise it's wonky and uh yeah so we didn't know if we could do buildings because in warcraft <laughs> 2 the buildings are smaller than the units standing next to them and so we didn't know if we would even be walking into houses or buildings uh, the, like the little single, like a smithy or something. We just had a, no idea what 3D, because uh, again, this was Blizzard's first uh, 3D game, side by side with Warcraft 3. They, not a lot of people were learning at the time. Got it. Yeah, it's just crazy too how how really that kind of that kind of thing just morphed into the Warcraft style yeah. that's so iconic today, right? Yeah. So. We have the floor open now for questions, so if you guys want to just raise your hand, we'll bring you up. But um, I'm going to read through some that were posted in chat. So Red Dawn was asking, you know, the faction, the, the Horde versus Alliance and how iconic those sort of, sort of identities are to the game. But today there's kind of like this desire to, you know, allow Horde and Alliance to play together because, you know, uh, the game is in this state where, you know, people want to be um, play with each other, and the barrier of the factions reduce, um, you know, the ability to play together. And so now there's like a more of a movement towards the, you know, horde alliance grouping with each other for raids and things like right. that. What's your kind of thoughts on that, and like the history of choosing the two factions to be kind of, you know, against each other sort of thing? Well, actually, that was the original uh, vision. I mean. The idea of splitting Horde and Alliance came from uh, oh, Kevin. Was it Ashron's call, or it was it was a uh, or, or was that a Mythics game? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, no, it was Dark Dark Age of Camelot is what was what that the first us one? To see proof of concept. Yeah, but, Dark Age of Camelot proved that it was. Like, that's fun. the one I took Adam into and said, "Look," yeah, <laughs> and he's like, "Okay, I get it," uh, but. But honestly, the idea came from the early RTSs, orcs versus humans, right? Like, for me, trying to do a game that didn't represent that at its core in some aspect was a huge mistake. So, yeah, I wrote that big document that one day and sent it to <laughs> just just rampaging, yeah. right? Sure. Like a young designer full of passion, oh, yeah. in no sense, you know? <laughs> right? Because like, I, I, I reread that document. <laughs> that document like a year later and i was like who is this naive oh <laughs> my right? god but um you i did write that the- document i sent it to adam and he was like yeah i basically agree with everything you're writing here and then i'm like yeah just to show you let's go play dark age of camelot and he was like i'm convinced we have to do factions yeah yeah, so, yeah but, but we I- were thinking of just doing the everquest thing the everquest thing which was just Everybody- yeah that the guards might hate you but everyone can group with everyone so yeah and then maybe I, I, you could work on your rep and be one of those trolls that can wander into Stormwind, you know. <laughs> but that was it. Right. And I'm sure there's probably a <sighs> an expedient reason why they want, you know, if you if it, it it shortens the time for grouping up for people if you're looking at the same quest, maybe. Um I it shortens the number of quests because you have Horde and Alliance quests now, right? guess i yeah i i don't know enough about the state of the game right now to to really give you a really good answer unfortunately but uh yeah that was originally the idea was to just lump everybody together and that was that was fine until kevin <laughs> changed <laughs> right. yeah. and that would if you remember like i because i remember you being one of the very few people that was on board with the idea and most of the team hating it at first blush Oh, because Kevin, they were I, like, what do you mean I can't play a dwarf and hang out with my friend who wants to play an orc? Right? Oh my like, god, yeah, the EverQuest guys. Yeah, it was, and it's because I'm not an EverQuest player. 
if, right. if, if the entire you were team, ultimate online, yeah. So you were more, like me, you were a little bit more hardcore. <laughs> if if everybody played EverQuest, there's so many things that would have like we would not have instancing if everybody played EverQuest. Right. I remember those team meetings, whether or not to instance. One, oh, yeah. it's, that was the huge controversy. Uh, just. Mm-hmm pacifying the uh the everquest junkies who are like really against uh instancing right. pvp wouldn't have been a thing or at least not in the in any real form like, right right i mean we, we didn't end up having a ton of it ourselves but we had more than everquest yeah, speaking so, of a, um, yeah huge controversy yeah speaking of the modern game um you know another thing that you mentioned in the book is this, you know you kind of go on this rant about uh, story in games or the lore or like how important story and narrative is in general and you know i always think about you know when i was reading that i was thinking about something you know chilton would always say is like it's more about the setting than the story you know it's yeah. more about like the world of elves less about like you know what they're you know uh, oh, what they eat for dinner or whatever like <laughs> minutia sort of things right or like with the drama between two characters or whatever but I would say that the game, the modern game, has taken a turn to where it is very kind of narrative focused, and you know, there's a lot more uh, cut scenes in the game between quests, and then a lot more voice. You know, there's voiceover in the game of all these right. different things, and you know, drama. Like a lot of the cutscenes and stuff are, are really about like the narrative and the drama between characters. What's your kind of you know thoughts on that? Why do you think that that shift happened? And you know, how was kind of story talked about? Because, you know, I kind of think, of course, Metzen and others on the team, you know, had a passion for the story, but it was really never so in your face that uh, than it is today. I, I know exactly why it happens. It's why 90% of things happened in an MMO is because of technology. It either it allows it or it limits it. When they have tools that allow in scripting you know, conversations, then there's going to be in scripting, you know, like in game conversations. Like, I mean, that, that, that's basically, we didn't have that technology starting out. So that was not even on the table. Yeah, uh, if, that's how cross server thing happened as well. Yeah. Everything cross server was all a technological lead. And honestly, the way uh, quest designers, how, how, how crazy those guys are, those guys are probably the most creative. That's definitely the most creative position on the team as a quest designer. If they had the scripting tools <laughs> for um, in in game conversations, you, they, that it would have absolutely been that way, and they would have pushed it to the nth degree, um, where where it's probably where it's at today. So yeah, it's just they had the the tools. I'm sure it's I th- I it sounds awesome to me. I'm, I'll, I'll say that, but. I don't know unless it interrupts gameplay too much, but uh, yeah, it's probably a good thing. It's actually a really interesting commentary, though, that like most technology in, in life, it's like we can build a thing, so we do. We never question whether we should or not. Yeah, we don't <laughs> right. bring it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you actually don't talk a ton about the work that you yourself do in the main wow diary john i noticed and we're kind of like pulling back into the the main section here but um yeah you released an addendum because you're so busy just like chronicling everybody else who clearly yeah. just esteems super duper highly right but uh, to talk about your own stuff a little bit more we talked about brd am i correct in thinking that you were responsible for karazan because you mentioned yes. it several times okay yeah Lovely dungeon. I feel like it's kind of a fan favorite. They even brought it back in Legion. And to me, it really still <laughs> it really still had that shine to it. And that again also has the hallmark of just being like a gigantic long stretch. It's vertical. There are weird yeah. subchambers and corners. What was it like to get something like that built? And why was it held until the expansion? Did you just build it later or did you just kind of have it on the burner for a long time and it wasn't technically feasible to get it in or? It had been the whipping post for many, many design meetings. We worked on it before we had the technology to actually realize dungeons before we could actually define what we were going to do. I remember working on it, geez, in 2000. One, I want to say maybe 2002. Oh my God. Uh, just to see, because 
we were building small dungeons, okay? And we, we, okay, we got these locked down. Let's do a worst case scenario. That's, that's going to be Karazhan. And this is where Karazhan was, uh, it had a completely different lore. There was a, a, a demon named Malganus was supposed to be in Karazhan. He had set up, you know, squatting into the, this wizard tower. That was the lore of, so it was a completely different uh, thing at the time. But it, 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 it was... That concept of dreadlords being homeless people. <laughs> yeah, the I know. The squad is so good. <laughs> and Night Stalker points out that that's kind of what they brought back when they did it in Legion. It's sort of being squatted in by a bunch of burning Legion characters. So, Oh, that's awesome. Well, the, the reason why is because by the tail end... By the tail end of the development cycle, we're talking 2004, Jeff Kaplan finally came back to us and said, you know what, guys, you know how I told you there's no such thing as a dungeon too big and there's no such thing, you know, (laughs) we have too much, we have too many dungeons, which is something that is just so mind blowing. Like, and that's why I was working on weekends is you know, like one of the reasons why uh, is that they gave me permission to work on weekends because, Oh my God, this is going to be an MMO. It's blizzard. It's got to be big. We have to have so much content. People are going to yep. burn through the content. You were and part of those early I'm games. like, Oh Remember my God. I got... Remember that list I came up with? It was oh, 50 yeah. dungeons long. Oh yeah. And we ended ridiculous. up shipping with like 20. I was <laughs> yeah. like, here's what we need to cover and, the content. And then at one point when we realize how long it takes to go through a dungeon and because people disconnecting at the time, from, well, you know, not everybody had broadband. Uh, it was, wow, this, we have too many, too many dungeons. And so we were pushing it off to a point where it could be uh, a hero. You know, it could be like take the, the center stage. And that's honestly why it's so polished is because – and I've looked at the list of the best dungeons, like uh, what's what's the Titan dungeon, Old War. Old War's mm-hmm. big. And it's funny, when you look at the best dungeons, it's the dungeons that have the most uh, particle effects, custom uh, props, the most textures, the most art thrown at it, the most animations, uh, the most custom sounds. And that is basically like, my God, it's three or four dungeons worth of textures. So when every room, every section looks different and is completely new artwork and props, then, yeah, oh, this is awesome. You know, everything's new where you get the Wailing Caverns or the, the or worse, the Hive, where you've got 11 textures and <laughs> very, very little artwork to, to, to work with. Where it's like, oh, God, there's more bugs in this room. You know, it's... That is, you know, that's the value. You're seeing lots and lots of uh, hours, you know, worth of uh, uh, work put into the dungeon, which is why it's so good. So I'd uh, forgotten we called it the hive for so long. Oh yeah, oh yeah, on crush, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 honestly, it's the amount of time that the developers spend on it. Like if 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 it gets a lot of love, it usually turns out pretty well. Carazon. Uh, I actually didn't build, let's see, I, I, I designed the outside and then I did the floor plan of the dungeon. And I think I built everything up to the, I did the stables, all the low level, ground level stuff. And then Aaron Keller, he had the floor plan and he did the banquet hall and the library, which is too big. We couldn't figure out how to, it's, it's funny. We, we had the entire thing built and then Jeff Kaplan is like, the library's too big. How do we make Karazhan, you know, this, how do we cut out the library? Which is the whole point of Karazhan was this, this massive library. And we right. tried to cut it down a little bit, but I mean, you know, we had, we're talking three months worth of work for not one person. We're talking a team of people. So, and this is where budget conscious developers learn to give like Metzen will give when you know a different concept is way easier to pull off he gets it he used to be you know a nuts and bolts developer uh jeff said okay that's fine you know go ahead leave the library in uh there just won't be any gameplay in it there's nothing we can do with it that's fine because 
when when I built Carazon, I remember the meeting. I had Pardo and Kaplan. They came in like, I don't know, this is 2003. We had like maybe two years left, a year and a half on the project. They, they, they said, every dungeon needs to be bigger. Okay, and this is the only two dungeons I was able to not make bigger were the Razorfin dungeons. And I, and I said, well, the canopy is so big, you know, we, we can't actually stretch that out, in which I was kind of stretching the truth a little bit. In truth, I was out of ideas of what you could do with stupid thorn bushes. So they kind of let that one alone, alone but they described Karazhan as as big as upper and lower Blackrock Spire together with Blackrock Deaths. Like basically all that, that's what the size of Karazhan, what the original version, vision of what that was. So yeah, you change, yeah, you improvise and, you know, a year later you realize, oh, we don't need that many dungeons. Oh, great. <laughs> And so we pushed it off to a, a, a better time. That's why it was uh, gotcha. delayed for so long. It's, it sounds like it had maybe the longest runway of any dungeon. So oh, yeah. Sort of oh, yeah. <laughs> it holds that spot in, in everybody's hearts. Yeah, John, um, you know, Candace isn't here tonight. And Candace, I'm not sure if you even remember Candace or if you worked with her very much back at Blizzard. But she's, so. she is now at, uh, at some point, she, she progressed to work on the WoW team. Uh, building a lot of uh, memorable encounters on the game, like raid bosses and things. But um, she's now working at Riot, working on their MMO. What's your kind of thoughts? You know, are you bullish or bearish about Riot making a huge MMO, something akin to like the next WoW sort of thing? And then also, what is your kind of thoughts, if you're willing to talk about it, on the post mortem of Titan and what Titan was trying to do? Because obviously that was originally going to be you know the next mmo at blizzard and it was very ambitious and yeah yeah um i'm i'm let's see what's what's the bad one i think it's bearish i think i'm bearish <laughs> i'm bearish on anyone making an mmo it's 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 too hard to make they're 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 hard to make uh if anyone i'm sure riot has the resources to do it so my hat's off to uh to a company that has that much <laughs> the manpower and woman power to throw at something as oh my god how do you how do you compete with wow as far as an mmo well i mean elden ring is gorgeous too you don't need an mmo you know you you, you capture the you capture the same spirit you know they also did not get the uh the work-life balance memo, a friend of mine remarked. <laughs> I don't oh, think from, really? I, don't, <laughs> I think FromSoft is also probably sick of pizza by now, is my guess. Right. But. Yeah. Well, that's what it takes. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it takes. Um, and let's see. The second question was, oh, yeah, on Titan. Uh, yeah, Titan was, I had low expectations for Titan when I went to the team. It was, I have, it's kind of funny. I was kind of burnt out. I was burnt out on WoW when I went to Titan, and I didn't like the idea of Titan when it was first presented to us. It was just too ambitious, and the gameplay, it, they didn't start with gameplay. That was literally, if you're not starting with gameplay, it's kind of like uh, Spore. You know, it's high concept, but it's, it doesn't come from a place where you're. Right. The moment-to-moment -moment design isn't strong. That has to work. Spore was a joke for, you know, for moment-to-moment. -moment. You know, feeding a worm is, eh, you know, avoiding. It's, it's not captivating play, uh, gameplay. And that wasn't nailed down. And you can throw as many, I, I mean, my God. My personal tinfoil hat theory is that Titan was something to uh, make Activision happy with Blizzard coming up with the next big thing? Because I mean, WoW had leveled out as far as you know income, and maybe somebody there was, oh yes, but you know we got to have something bigger. And it was just, it was a crazy design. It was. Well, what do you think? There, what, what what did it start with? If it didn't start with gameplay, what what did it start with? It started with concept. I mean, it had some really good ideas of making... The concept was, let's see, like 
people, uh, players were superheroes with an alternate identity, and they'd have a, a like a Sims type of gameplay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it was so rather than coming up with like a vision of a player, there's experience, no proof of it was concept. More of yeah. like a list of features that would be rad. Yeah, saying. well, I mean, it was an amalgamation of other games, but there's no proof of concept. Yeah, that this peanut thing. butter and chocolate oh, awesome. together. And- yeah, like I like milkshakes and I like hamburgers, but you know, you don't blend them together. It's it it, it just things just didn't connect, and there was so much money spent on the project that everybody on the project was kind of panicking like i made (laughs) i walked in the first week i made enemies on the project the first week i said we were in a meeting with rob pardo and you know jeff and aaron all the all the big designers are are there and i said you guys are putting the cart before the horse i don't know why you're pulling level designers onto this project (laughs) when you don't have gameplay i mean it's to me it was just like such a basic, it, it felt like a, a mistake that a high schooler, like someone who had never <laughs> made a game before, would make. Like it was, it was just weird. It and just, yeah, maybe it just was like the arrogance of Blizzard. We we're just riding high at the time, right? And yeah, and maybe maybe it was part partly that. But you know, Kevin, I remember like on the WoW team, we used to call people going to Titan. I mean, they used to call. Jokingly called Titan, like the team the, summer camp. No, well, team summer camp, summer camp, or the retirement home, sort of. Like. Oh my god! <laughs> and so, oh my god! I never heard to, that. Here's, yeah. my, here's my tinfoil hat idea. People oh. were so burned out at, on WoW that they wanted a project that had endless blue sky in the future, <laughs> so oh. they could move to and just sit there for a while. Oh man! And some so people wanted to go to an agile problems. development. Yeah. It, w- it was hell. Some people the wanted to go to an week. agile project like Hearthstone yeah. and be like, I want to make something that's ready to go in like a year. Right. And other people were like, oh, I just want to sit and sit in the pool for a bit. You know? maybe, yeah, cozy maybe, and- maybe designers had that uh, forethought, but like none of the artists, like if you, I remember at one point, there were only two artists on the entire environment team and when i mean environment team i mean uh there well we had matt malizia okay he's he's happy and prolific no matter what but then they had uh for for the environment team for the level designers matt was like more on the concept side and you know uh landscape stuff uh for actually buildings the project was so big nobody wanted to work on it the entire Blizzard campus, not a single artist wanted to be on the, or, or came to Team Titan because it was just way too much work. And so they had two guys, they were both from the Netherlands, okay? And these poor guys had work visas that were, if I don't know how U.S. law is now, but they yeah, couldn't yeah. just jump from Blizzard to Riot to another company because of complicated laws when you have uh, foreign nationals working on American soil. So they were literally trapped on, on Project Titan. And the tools they had were just abysmal, and it was just a miserable existence for those poor guys. Um, as much as I didn't like working on that project, uh, it was, uh, I think, worse so from them. So... Yeah, which I think is the lesson, right? It's just you gotta you gotta start small, you know, on the on the on the core of what you wanna yeah. the experience to be and let's just go wide and broad like like they did. Moment so. moment to moment gameplay has yeah. to be nailed down before you even uh uh solicit anybody for money. You have to have that figured out. You cannot figure out gameplay. Nobody has ever done that ever. It's yeah. just, it's never, I, I can't think of a game that someone's actually figured out gameplay. They bring it that, you know, there's tests and you got, you got people with inspiration, like portal will come up with a new idea, but those guys, you know, they're, they're starting with the moment to moment gameplay, you know, even if they're creating it themselves, the idea of building a team and then say, okay, guys, What's the moment-to-moment gameplay going to be? You'll never, ever figure that out. 
And it's it's funny because you know when thinking about because you know sometimes a team or investors or whoever ask like how do we how do we judge milestones or how do we judge when something's working or whatever. And I, the way I kind of think about it is like when you do a play test, it's not so much of like oh well you know, it hit these X like bullet list of features or things. It's more about like what was kind of the experience, what was the emotion you got out of it, right? And whenever I think about WoW and I think about the emotions I had when I played through Hillsbrad or ran around Teldrassil or whatever, right? And so, right. okay, so we do have a question from June. June, I'll bring you up. Uh, Hello. Hi. (laughs) Hello. Hey. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for writing the book. It was it was an amazing um, an amazing read. Thank you. But I actually found the ending incredibly sad. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, th- through the book, the team builds this epic world with 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 insane effort. And once you shipped, had your break, everyone went back to work. So I got the feeling of an endless march, forever making stuff for the players to do, instead of refining this beautiful world. So yes. did you get this feeling? Yeah, so- yeah, I think it accurately... Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, when I look at the book, it's fun and uh it's a fun read at the beginning you know but by the time you're you're finishing the story when it's 2004 it's less fun you start feeling just the monotony of you know chapter after chapter we got a new zone and you know we've got it and it's because there's no new features going into the book and once we launched wow it was the most depressing time ever half the team left uh, it, it, we were bug fixing yep. and morale was very low. It was incredibly low. There were, there were, there were days where I remember I would just leave at two in the afternoon because I just felt I was the only level designer. Like all the other level designers went to other companies. I was the only person in uh, dungeon design and I just went home because one, there was nothing to work on because everybody was fixing bugs. And we had tons of dungeons to, you know, already locked and loaded to go f- for the updates anyway. But it was just, you know, half of the people aren't there, and hiring was super slow. And it was just, yeah, it was, it was a sad ending. But that's that's actually kind of what it was like, you know. We we all got the wow on our resume, and a lot of people, you know, they cashed in on that, and they went to better, you know, greener pastures. And good for them, you know, but for the guys, you know, <laughs> holding the fort down, Kevin, I don't know, Chris, when did you uh, join? What, what year were you? Uh, uh, it was like, um, so I joined after like, middle end that. of BC, middle end okay. of BC, I think it was. Okay. So. It was a lot better then. Okay. So you yeah, missed the yeah. real, Kevin was there in the gnarly, t- mm-hmm. gnarly time. Yeah. I yeah. remember that meeting. I don't know if you were there, but I remember that meeting where we got one of our new uh, network programmers uh, from somewhere, and it was like his first team meeting, right. and everyone was down in the dumps, and he was oh. just like, "What in the hell is going on here?" He was so <laughs> shocked. It's like yeah. you realize everyone in the industry wants to be working right now, right here, because <laughs> he was like one of the you know first people to get in, and he was like, he yeah. had seen the success of very early WoW. He saw the promise, you know. And all of us were missing that, of course, because the game was kind of on fire. You know, <laughs> like um, there were server issues and database issues and all kinds of things that we couldn't fix. And like, yeah, just morale was just terrible. And he came in and he actually had the nerve to step in and like try to give us a pep talk. You know, yeah, like, yeah. He was like, "I'm brand new here, but I don't know what's happening. <laughs> like, you guys are so sad. You've just made the greatest thing ever." Yeah. And everyone here seems so down in the dumps. It was like it was really shocking. Yeah, but that's, that's yeah, that was the reality. Yeah, I remember Corey telling me, John, you know, Corey Stockton when he joined. Um, I think he said it was like there was like hardly any level designers on the team at the time. Like so many had left or something like that. I can't remember, but yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I could talk to you about that offline, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's some. Uh, uh, yeah, that's um he was yeah, when when he interviewed uh 
Yeah, two people. Well, when he interviewed, I think there's one, two, three, Aaron, Dana, and I. I was the only one left by the time he came in. Like it was a two week thing. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a bad time. It was a bad time. We didn't know how. Like we were paranoid of whether or not we were going to make any money. Like we made. And it's kind of funny. Like I know the like. From from the financials, like Mark would tell me what's going on, like Wow made zero money from China. That 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 is like the like the Chinese like I think the monthly subscription was like two fifteen two dollars and fifteen cents, and of that, sixty percent went to the government, thirty percent went to you know the partner, and like Wow had like you know twenty cents. I like it, it was just a it was the worst thing. And like we were really worried. I mean, Frank Pierce that that horrible meeting when Frank said like don't expect bonuses for World yeah, of Warcraft. That's right. Because because yeah. and this is our perception. And, like and we, we didn't know we were going to have a million crunch and everything. Yeah, and we were yeah. This is <laughs> oh, <laughs> just like no, oh, we're reinvesting in servers. Sorry, oh, there's no money left. <laughs> my God. And and it, our our owner Vivendi. Uh, the the CEO was being chased through the streets. Who's you know went to to prison? Uh, there was no money. Like there was mm-hmm. no money to borrow from Blizzard. We borrowed uh, money for the servers on a bank loan. That that's that that's how bad it was. Like we didn't even have invest. We couldn't get investors because of the poisonous Vivendi. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was. Uh, Where was yeah. Microsoft then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> um. Okay, so we have another question from Rockman. Hey, how you doing? Um, I actually talked to you about uh, Warsaw and Gulch a long time ago, but uh, you previously you were talking about um, conflicting ideologies with dungeons, um, how some of them are like grand, epic, sprawling spaces, um, yeah. but in Burning Crusade they kind of became these like uh, loops um, that were like designed to be yeah. farmed over and over. And um, I've kind of noticed in retail that this type of philosophy even applies to the overall world where like every 3D object is a collectible or a quest item or something interactable where everything serves a purpose. And this is really uh, contrasting to vanilla, like um, zones like Thousand Needles or Desolus, where it's just this massive desert. (laughs) Yeah, You don't have a mount. And it takes you forever to walk across this thing. It's kind yeah. of miserable, but in a way, um, it's very immersive. You actually feel like you're in a desert. Right. And, you know, Classic WoW came out, and a massive number of players were so excited to go back to the original world. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on Classic returning and how the philosoph- philosophical differences between these two games are so different, but it's the same game. Yeah. It's kind of funny. One of my friends in, in, in my Pathfinder podcast, he, he plays classic WoW. He plays WoW every week, and he raids. And he tells me how simple the raids are in WoW and how nobody realizes how easy uh, 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 Molten Core is. It's just a trivial. It's trivial. And, Kevin, I don't know if you know this, but they're playing with uh, threat meters, which is the entire point of molten core like if you have a threat meter telling you you're pulling aggro like they have that now and people just back off they don't they they don't attack so you what what i would that what i take from that is you have a completely different audience the audience today (laughs) they grew up with world of warcraft you know Mm -hmm. they it's there's so much more intelligence the 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 quote mistakes that we were making at the time were you know we can't have large dungeons because people disconnect because pe- not everybody has a uh, high speed you know internet right. connection with it. some people have dial up connections that's one reason not to have a large dungeon so you just have a different uh, audience today I think that that that's basically the easiest answer some people and they want different things you know they've seen so many zones that the majesty of going through Thousand Needles and the, the Barrens is lost the 1,000th time you've been to a desert. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a, a more uh, aware audience. Awesome. Well, thank you for answering that. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Rockman. Um, Reynolds. 
Hey, John. Um, hey. I kickstarted your book. I, I love everything you've done. You've been on a lot of podcasts over the years. I've listened to some of those back then. I have a <laughs> joke question for you. Sure. Uh, this was in 2018. You were on a podcast before Classic came out. And you joke, the, the host coaxed you into a response about when did you think WoW Classic would come out. And I, it's always stuck in my head since the conversation <laughs> yeah. because it came out a year, like almost the day after. And you said, if it doesn't come out, if it's something to the effect of, if, if it comes out within two years, I'll eat my hat. Yeah, and I, yeah. I thought that was so funny, but I just wanted to prod and let you know you're great. And maybe if you have some insight there into, I mean, maybe you've stepped away from the industry long enough that like you just were blown away that they could do it, or maybe you just didn't comprehend, but maybe you have some thoughts about that. Well, the, 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 the problem with, uh, the reason why I said that is because, uh, just again, to jump in real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Jump in. And he took his hair with it. So <laughs> yeah. he's, he's a man of his word. Yeah. <laughs> My, yeah. You can see I have no hair now. Um, the, what I was talking about was basically I left Blizzard in 2011. Okay. So, uh, my idea of what Blizzard is, you know, listening to the troops and then kind of leading from behind uh, was kind of how the, the, the spirit of World of Warcraft was. It's Warcraft 3. Uh, a lot of the older uh, games went that way. If they were listening to the developers when they were making decisions on whether or not to make uh, classic WoW, I just didn't, I, I, and I know for a fact that I can't imagine any developer would want to work on a game that's been built before. What, where's the fun in that being, you know, walking in somebody else's footsteps. And so that's kind of why I said, I didn't think blizzard was actually going to go that way, especially because, you know, we're, I don't know if there was a lot of unbalanced classes, uh, uh, uh unbalanced dungeons, unbalanced quests, unbalanced, like, there, there was massive holes in the game, problems that I think people look back with rose-colored glasses that they kind of forget were kind of hairy. Like when when Jalen Brack says, "You think you want the no, you know, classic well, but you really, really don't." I honestly agree with J. Allen Brack. I don't think it does. It, it, I don't think it's something that has a lot of legs like once they released uh classic wow because the conversation at the time was just stick with classic wow and not come out with updates not come out with expansions we just wanted classic wow because i think that's what the servers were offering at the time the uh the uh, the russian servers or you know the hack right, servers. the private ones yeah yeah so i i just didn't see blizzard looking at that as worthwhile if we're just going to have one server and we're only going to have classic wow do we really want to force our developers to work on something that they don't want to do that's not really engaging uh to come out with something that doesn't there's a lot of headaches i mean they had to rebuild they had to rebuild the entire database for for classic wow like that that that's right. that's that's where the work was. Like, how do you, <laughs> I mean, when you it have was a, more, yeah. maybe that it was, it was unfun work to do. And it, why put them through that? Yeah. And, 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 and this, I'm certain it wasn't a popular decision with the developers that I think is where the resistance was lying in the fact that when you go to blizzard, you want to put your name on something. You don't want to work on John stats dungeon, you know, that's no fun. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't want to do that. I, I hate doing, you know, working. I don't, I, I don't like doing remakes of my own work, let alone somebody else's and sure. not having the freedom to improve on it. See, that's the thing that's so antithetical uh, to, to going back to something. When you can't improve on Vanilla WoW, whether you're uh, doing talents or doing anything, that just doesn't sound fun to me. So that's why I was saying that. And yes, I did. Kevin's right. I did eat my hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for entertaining that. Right on. Thank you, Kevin, for the jokes. Okay. Um, I think that's going to be our last hand raise question for now. Uh, I got a hard stomp in a couple of minutes. But, John, there is something I've been dying to ask you, which is that you spent 10 years in Manhattan's ad world, and Chris and I are huge Mad Men fans. Oh, yeah. 
We need to know either what your favorite moment of the show is, but more interestingly, what's your craziest Madison Avenue experience? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so Mad Men is interesting. Uh, you, you, there were, there was one ad agency that I worked at. I, I, I freelanced for a lot of ad agencies um, before working on Madison Avenue, taking a full time job there. I worked there, by the way, for one month before I went to Blizzard, where I fi- I freelanced for for ten years. And I t- finally took a full time position for one month when I got the letter from Blizzard saying. Here's your job offer. Cut your salary in half and come to Southern California. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. That sounds like a good idea. Um, my my the mad okay, so Mad Men was really the industry has super changed from the Mad Men show. But there were some old dinosaurs, old men still there that had kidding. survived. Yeah, you could kind of see those like that mentality. You know, like the the way they did, the way they thought. But honestly, it's it, it really wasn't. I, I most of the designers worked in tiny little offices. Uh, all the ad execs, uh, anybody who de- dealt with a client, they got the window office. So I was always, and which is great because I was on the art team. I want to see my screen, so I didn't want a windowed office. So yeah. like I was always on, in these little like corners, but. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, I was a freelancer, so crazy hours. Okay, so New York uh, works from ten o'clock till ten o'clock. The ad, the the ad industry, whether or not there's work to do. So if there's oh, wow. like fifty people there, it, and you have to, the culture there is a completely different culture. Is that you got third or second generation ad people. So whose parents were in the ad industry? Yeah, they're Roger Sterling's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you 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 get in there and everybody shows up like nine thirty, ten o'clock, which is kind of when Blizzard, like when we showed up at Blizzard too. But when somebody's working on one of their campaigns and you're not, you hang out there anyway, just so that they don't feel alone. And I was a freelancer. I didn't mind. I was making fifty dollars, fifty five dollars an hour to just sit there and shoot the nineties money. My man. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was. I was very well played. I I was like the highest. Well, I was really good with uh, something very specific that nobody could do, like photo retouching, uh, really quick. Um, And like they would fight for me. So I keep raising my price (laughs) until somebody. So I was making good money. And then they. what they did is uh, we we sat around and uh, talked, but yeah, the uh, the the two hour commutes into the city would be only one hour if you leave after like eight thirty nine o'clock. So it was like we all ate dinner together. I don't know, and, and it's a weird thing because these a lot of people had kids. These are where they they must have been just absolute strangers to their families where they would work. Uh, till 10 o'clock at night, that's when they'd leave the city, okay? So an hour later, they're then getting home, and, you know, they're doing the next thing, and that's four days a week, uh, but nobody ever leaves before 8 o'clock. Nobody ever leaves, and nobody complains. Nobody complains. Like, there's nobody bitching about the late hours. You don't even see the fatigue on people. So it's just a culture that they... That's New York. You know, if you want to work in New York, that's what it is. So I don't even know if that's the way that it is now, because we're talking, of course, you know, late 90s. So who yeah, knows if yeah. it's different now. I don't know if they had their EA spouses moment. Probably not. Probably not. No. Nobody cares about ad execs. That's for sure. <laughs> no one's an advocate for ad advertising people. Yeah. Now the business is basically like Google ads and Facebook. It must be not as exciting, but yeah. Maybe so. Yeah. I don't even know if those companies are even there anymore. Well, awesome. Let's, uh, let's bring this one to a close. Wow. Fell personal apology. I'm so sorry for steamrolling over your question. I'm starving to death and we got to get out of here. But, uh, John, thank you so, 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 so much for coming on. Thank you much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. I know everybody loved having you again. And Kevin, it's awesome to have you back and, uh, and, and riffing with John. Yeah. Super fun. We miss you a bunch. Yeah. 
Okay, so we try to do this every week. It never happens, but uh, leave your questions and comments <laughs> in the Discord. We will be back soon. Until next time, Chris, do you want to sign us off? Yeah, yeah. Well, and John, yeah, we'll have to do maybe a round two sometime. Just totally. so much more notes I have here. But uh, yeah, well, everybody, later, gamers. Adios, folks. Good night.